Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services, with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. It is not a stretch to consider beer, wine, and spirits more than just a pleasure or novelty business, but a growing part of the culture and the commerce of the Carolinas. After all, it's a direct product of one of our longest running and most effusive industrial sectors, agriculture. Welcome again to the most widely watched source of Carolina business and public policy. For the last 25 years now, I'm Chris William, and thank you for watching and supporting this program. What is the deeper meaning when we share a glass or raise a pint? It is certainly a feel-good practice, but what is the clear-headed observation of spirits of the Carolinas, so to speak? We go way beyond moonshine and NASCAR, but we, we want to talk and we will talk to sommeliers about this very vibrant and competitive industry. Stay with us. Major funding also by Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Henry DePew, president and co-owner of RJ Rockers, Ed Shelton, co-owner of Shelton Vineyards, Trey Boggs, owner of Palmetto Distillery, and Deanna Bradish, founder of Red Clay Cider Works. Here's Chris Williams. Hello, welcome to our program. You know, it's a conversation before the cameras actually roll that's the fun part of it, about finding out how you make stills, how you get stills legally, <laughs> mostly, hopefully. You know, Ed, I, I want to start with you. This whole idea of beer, wine, and spirits in the Carolinas. Ed, you've been, you've been growing grapes now for several years, have the largest family-owned uh, vineyard in, the, in North Carolina, certainly, probably South Carolina. When you hear some of the, you know, some of the early comments we had before the cameras rolled were kind of the, the Western days, you know, the Wild West days. Was it like that for wine in North Carolina not so long ago? Not as bad as it is today. Uh, there was not as many regulations uh, when we started. And a lot of the regulations uh, that you have today, have, have, uh, some of them have come since we started. But we still had to go through all the hoops, the yeah. federal and the state requirements. But it was not as strict then as it is now. Do, do you, for you all, uh, first of all, welcome. Good to have you all here. Um, do you, Henry, do you feel like it's uh, more lenient now uh, to, to try to make beer, certainly in the upstate, than it, it was? It's not. We started in 97, and I think there was, um, when we started in 97, people thought we were crazy to start a brewery in Spartanburg, South <laughs> Carolina. Um, they didn't think we'd be welcomed, et cetera. And so I think public... The public has accepted breweries a lot more, and I think people certainly want to, they, you know, they're, the public themselves are much more interested in knowing where beer's made, who makes mm. it, how it's mm. made, and, and things along those lines, which I think is what really hel helps kind of all of our industries is that people, people are intrigued. They want to know uh, how it's made. So I think regulations have probably increased, but I think public awareness and interest in actually buying a local product and kind of connecting with a brand or connecting with where something's made has increased. Wait, you, you know, you go from beer that's been much more generally accepted and not quite the bad boy outlaw thing <laughs> about moonshine <laughs> trade. <laughs> yeah, this kind of works, but does it for you? It's your brand. But, but seriously, I mean, you've heard the comments so far, Trey. You're making moonshine, you, yeah. mostly legal, I hope. Yeah, every bit of it. I mean, that's the only thing that separates us from the bootlegger moonshine in the woods. That's how we learned our still was made by a fifth generation bootlegger. And the only thing that separates us from that jar I showed you earlier was uh, it's still in the mason jar, is taxes. 
Yeah. Is it is it uh, it's generally accepted now? It's legit to have moonshine and selling moonshine. Is it is it harder to comply with regulations than you thought it would be? Is it getting harder? Is it getting easier? Well, I think it's always been accepted for hundreds of years. I think the government's the only one that didn't accept it. But now, I mean, we just did a, a big thing with South Carolina State Pride and. Uh, to have the government behind us now is very exciting. I mean, to, to, to know that we're following the laws, we're paying our taxes, and we're being able to put the spotlight on a heritage of moonshine that's been around for hundreds of years. I mean, I'm very proud. I mean, South Carolina's first permit uh, for legal moonshine, it was unheard of, you know, mm -hmm. five or six years ago. So it's been very exciting. Deanna, you're kind of the newest one on the block here, just opened uh, uh, the Cider Works in Charlotte. Right. W when you hear the dialogue, w what comes to mind for you? Well, um, since we're coming to the game as is, I, we don't have a lot of history to see how it's changed. So we just kind of deal with the rules, you know, going forward. But to your question around, do we think it's getting more difficult or uh, easier? Mm -hmm. I'd have to say uh, from the cider industry, we just had a recent success with the Cider Act passing that uh, enabled us to ferment and have cider at over 7% without having um, the taxation and the carbonation rules also. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a big win and I think that mm -hmm. the legislators are seeing the economic impact across states and across the country that the craft industry can have and the challenges that maneuvering the regulations can be and they're, they're working toward trying to make that easier and so it makes mm -hmm. more sense for companies and, and the government. You know, I, I don't want to go down this road too far, but it, it makes sense. We're talking about the genesis of legalized uh, distilling or brewing mm -hmm. or certainly wine that's been uh, very popular for a long time. Colorado and California recently legalized cannabis sales, not medical cannabis sales. Do you think that would ever happen in North Carolina, in South Carolina? Not for a while. Yeah. No, I don't. What does that is that com you know and Ed I'm maybe unfairly or fairly lumping it into what you do for a business is that the same thing that we're talking about here? I don't think so. I think it's um it's a different um it's a different drug so to speak mm -hmm. and uh it creates more problems I think for the public to deal with uh that we're not used to dealing with it yet. And some of the states that have legalized marijuana has has found that it's created some problems. Yeah, more so than they expected. Right. Henry, what do you think? I, I'm intrigued to see as the different states do it, you know, as prohibition ended in 33, um, you know, it was intriguing that the government decided that there needed to be three tiers then. I'm more intrigued with the model of how the legalization um, actually works or how it should work. You know, will that eventually drive, I, I think eventually it will become legal um, mm -hmm. probably across most states and I think if that happens to me the the intriguing part will be how will that distribution channel actually work and you know will you end up with some big company in RJ or somebody that actually own controls it. Yeah, yeah you know mm -hmm. production and distribution and everything so I think in, in my mind it's interesting to just look at the model and what the government forced on um, breweries and wineries and distilleries and you know are there similarities in those, and should there be, and how does that all unfold? So. You know, you know. Besides, kind of the, the the fun part about talking about what you do, and I'm not Henry. It might have been you or, or one of your partners that said you just wanted to have beer for life. That's kind of what yeah. started this yeah. whole idea. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that was definitely Mark. And uh, yeah, but you know, you, you just you just said something. You talked about the distribution and transportation of it. Um, in North Carolina, in South Carolina, transportation is arguably one of the hottest political issues. And it's not just about roads, but it's about infrastructure. When you hear transportation, mm -hmm. when you're talking about getting your product out, Trey or Deanna, or moving it across state lines legally or within the state, what comes to mind? Do you, are you, do you find that transportation policy in South Carolina, particularly I'm looking at you, Trey, is it where it needs to be? Well, it hasn't caught, it hasn't stopped us from getting a shipment there. Now, doesn't mean all the bottles got there without being broken. <laughs> but, uh, different you, you know, that's packaging, I guess, a different apartment. But uh, it hasn't stopped us from getting from our distillery to the the distributor in Columbia. And Deanna, what about you? You're Charlotte centric, but would you like to be further? Uh, yeah, we. I envision us reaching out in the at least across the state uh, sometime in the next year, probably. And um, you know whether we remain self-distributing because uh, unlike the uh, distillers, we in the 
cider and beer market in North Carolina can mm -hmm. self-distribute. So, but that, uh, uh, for example, the toll road on 77 will affect, you know, transportation going, you know, north uh, out of Charlotte. So, um, but whether we go with a distributor who handles the out-of-state, you know, will mm -hmm. be, by state law, we'll have to dis use distributors, so. Does your professional uh, life dictate how you feel about, you know, you talked about the I-77 North Corridor of Charlotte, and I know there's a very hot political right, issue right. in that region. Is that, does that, besides having a personal dog in that hunt, if right. you will, d from transportation policy for you, do you wade in on it because you want to make sure that there, that it flows more freely, no pun intended? Well, yeah, certainly. I mean, you have to consider all factors, not just what affects you personally and with your own business, but how does it affect mm -hmm. Uh, the rest of the economy in Charlotte and the uh, commuter quality of life and the costs that you know it could potentially cost the other residents mm -hmm. and so you really need to consider all those factors when you're you know deciding which way you want to weigh in on a political yeah and you know I I'm sorry but I'm gonna have to leverage your your past DOT experience oh, here gosh. in North Carolina <laughs> you, when you read the stories right. when you hear about and not just I-77 but in general transportation policy in, in your case, in the old North State, what, what comes to mind for you? Well, I think the biggest thing is that we've got to come up with a new way of um, uh, producing revenues for the, the states. Mm -hmm. uh, the gas tax, uh, cars are becoming more efficient and the cost of construction has skyrocketed. So we've got to come up with a new way of um, taxing motorists mm -hmm as opposed to paying at the pump. We've got to come up with something like the GPS system where you're taxed based on the mileage that you drive. Now that, that would mean that each state has got to change their uh, formula or the way they collect taxes mm -hmm. now and it's got to be nationwide. But advent of electric cars, hybrid cars, all of that, there's less uh, gasoline sold per mile today than there was 10 years ago. But the cost of road construction has uh, gone up about four times. What would changing the formula, the funding in, in either state, would changing that funding formula ameliorate the issues around congestion, do you think? Well, it would create a bigger pool of money to uh, take care of our needs. And if we don't have good roads, uh, our products can't get to market efficiently. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we come to grips with this, quit talking about it, and do something about it. Yeah. Henry, what do you think? Same thing. Same thing. As we ship beer, um, it doesn't matter where in the Carolinas, you know, all the way to Wilmington or um, wherever, we just try to do it as effectively as possible. So as we're looking at it, we want to ship a full truckload. And if that means we have to stop in Charlotte and then Raleigh uh, on the way to Wilmington, that's it's kind of the way that we try and do it so that we can structure those trucks so that it's mm -hmm. the lowest kind mm -hmm. of cost per ounce of, of beer leaving the brewery. Does current DOT policy in North Carolina or South Carolina, does that affect you one way or another? It's not something that we bring into our daily, mm -hmm. you know, no. it's kind of a, we go out and ask for three different trucking companies to quote us a price and we look at it from there and away we go. Right. So it's not something from there that we're actively mm -hmm. pursuing kind of day to day on on that side. You, do you all have, you all have a skill that you need to do what you do? Trey, do you, do you, do you find, is it short? Let me back up and say there, there's a big dialogue that goes on about, they call it a worker skills gap, that a lot of businesses can't find the talent that they need to do the jobs that they need to be competitive. Do you feel that? Well, you know, our moonshine was hauled out of the woods at one time, so talking about the roads, I guess having asphalt with a few potholes has been <laughs> nice, so I can't complain about that. S but. Slowed down the people uh, that were yeah. chasing you. Yeah. But as far as skills, I mean, we, we learned from the bootleggers. It was guys that had been doing it from their family and generation to generation, and, and they were, after time, could trust us to share a recipe because we were going to put the spotlight on the, the art, the true art of, it wasn't always about outlaws and bad boys and breaking laws because there were people that did it just to put food on the table for their family uh, for hundreds of years. That's mm -hmm. been going on. So that was our true intentions was to show the true authenticity of moonshine and what it meant to the South. And, you know, by paying the taxes allowed us to do that. Mm -hmm. Talent. I'll jump in. Yeah. Uh, so the business model from our cidery is very similar to the breweries. And uh, so from the cider maker standpoint, there are several courses and, and brewer 
there are uh, university courses now for brewing and cider making and wine making. Uh, so in the region here that people can access? Sure, yeah, yeah. sure. Here in the region, yeah. um, App State has a program, and I believe uh, CPCC is starting a program also. Um, so from the top down, the brewer and cider maker, uh, we have we have those mm -hmm. people coming out educated, and then from the uh, manufacturing side, really, which is what the production of the brewing and cider making and distilling, you know, what, as it goes mm -hmm. through the equipment mm -hmm. and the packaging, and then the distribution model. I mean, none of that is new. So, uh, because we're not to that level from an employee standpoint, I don't see that being a challenge for us. And then from the tap room standpoint, you know, you've got servers and bartenders. Um, so it's all very established sort of skill mm -hmm. sets that we need. Um, but maybe somebody looking for the right people to do those jobs is better equipped to answer whether we have a shortage here to, to, to do those warehouse type jobs. I, I think it's getting better, at least from our side. <coughs> you know, and I'd say five, six years ago when we were looking for a brewer, it was much more difficult to find somebody that you wanted to bring in that had skills. And I think there are, just with the advent of the number of breweries around the country, there's a lot more people with those skills and there's also a lot more people interested in learning it. And I think, you know, we were all talking beforehand about how all of us from starting a business really, um, you know, you learn something every day. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it doesn't matter if it's on the business <clears throat> side or the skills side of mm -hmm. brewing or transportation. I think it's really what you kind of each day making those improvements and learning and then taking those to keep getting to the next level and keep those going. And, uh, you know, we certainly all have employees that you have to trust and that you really, that's probably the biggest decision we have as a company is who you hire. What, what do you have to trust them with? A everything, your product, your quality. You know, I think as you look at the number of people getting into these industries, at some point in time, the consumer's gonna vote and it's gonna come down to, um, you know, what's the best product, what do I love, how does, how, how do I do that? So at least from RJ Rocker's standpoint, we've tried very hard to say we need to continue improving quality every day um, in order to make sure that our product gets better and better, mm -hmm. and uh, and it's something that people want to drink. Ed, what, what's what's the worker's skills gap like for you? Do you see it? Well, we're very fortunate um, at Surrey Community College. We have uh, one of the few uh, full viticultural programs in the in the East Coast. Mm -hmm. It has its own winery, it has its own vineyard, um, and it it's turned out students um, that go all over the country now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's attracting students uh, from all over the country. So when we first started, the, we were the 12th winery in the state. Uh, there was not a, a, a very educated workforce, educated in uh, growing of the grapes. So we had to import uh, from Oregon, our, our field labor, mm -hmm. uh, and our winemaker. Was that a seasonal hire for you? No, it's full time. <clears throat> uh, growing grapes is, is uh, unlike any other agricultural product, there's something going on in the fields all the <laughs> time. Uh, right now we're, we're cutting everything back, so there's something going on every day. The, you know, you, you talk about Surrey Community College building out a, a fairly rigorous mm -hmm. source for your talent. Right. Did that happen be, because you were there, or did you decide to relocate in the Mount Airy, Surrey County? No, we, we helped get the program started after we got started. <clears throat> um, we, we, we funded it for the first two years, and then the state took up the funding after that. How does that work on the distilling side? Well, thank you. <laughs> Henry, I'm happy to switch <laughs> with you, because I, I was going to say the same thing, but thank you. Well, I mean, when we started, of course, you had people that weren't sure, legal moonshine, is this a trap? <laughs> you yeah. know, we had people right. that were, knew how to make it, but can you really do it? So for a while, it was a bump your head, and uh, now, and I brag on my guys, we've got a great bunch of guys in the production that, I mean, I can depend on them, I can trust them. If we get a purchase order in, I know that it's going to go out correctly and it's going to land where it needs to be. And uh, so we're getting in a better rhythm of what to look for. Because when we were beginning, we just knew what we wanted to do, but how to get there on the trial and error of, of that. So <laughs> yes, it was a little bit tricky because not a lot of people that just, oh, I can make moonshine. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, trial and error, but you know, it's the only way to figure it out. You know, Trey, do you feel like you've got a, uh, you feel like you've got a good support network, a good peer group? And, and I don't mean just moonshiners, but I mean in general, for what you do, 
Do you have the, con you know, these guys talked about having uh, in their kind of their physical orbit around them the folks that would have like interests. Do you feel like you have that in Anderson? Uh, well, I was going to say the craft industry in a whole, I mean, is really pulled together and uh, you're getting more and more expos and even beer and wine. I mean, there's more and more uh, people out there that have been down that road, um, you know, to where you can even talk to the big house distillers to, mm -hmm. to find out the do's and don'ts. And um, so I'd say yes. I mean, it's getting better uh, because as more as craft gets to be more and more, the customers are smart. Uh, they've got a lot of assets. They've got a lot of technology. There's a lot of websites that they can find out. It doesn't take long to find out if that product's good or not. You know, and that's why we, we make it. We have an open door uh, anytime. Uh, six days a week where you can come in and see it being made and see what's in that bottle, whether it's in Scotland or uh, Georgia or wherever, South Carolina, it's, uh, it, you can see where it's been produced. Deanna, do you feel like you've get, do you feel like you're in a business or do you feel like you're in something that's a little bit more fraternal? Um, both, both. Mm -hmm. Definitely the fraternal. Yes. I mean, the Charlotte market, the craft market in general, when we have, we have a National Cider Maker Association, I mean, everybody comes together to help each other out. There's a lot of, uh, electronic, you know, blogs for uh, pro brewers and, and cider makers mm -hmm. and whatnot. So you can share not just within your own community, but across regions and states. Um, but then, uh, you know, there's the very real side of the business side from a legislation and distribution mm -hmm. and, you know, sheer costs and, and the um, staff development like mm -hmm. you're asking about. So, so really, there's definitely both. We, we deal with uh, more traditional business challenges. I think that's the fun part as the consumer gets more interested in kind of local. And I think a lot of us are small enough that it's the knowledge base of, you know, if we screw something up, you can call somebody and be like, hey, how would you do this? Right. And, um, Supposedly. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. So that was hypothetical. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you yeah. wholeheartedly. So that, that's a free exchange of information. You all don't feel proprietary about, in, in your case, what R.J. Rockers is doing? Um, we don't. And, and I, think that's, I think that's something that's actually helped, and I think the consumer sees that. So, you know, from that standpoint, we're very good friends with a lot of the breweries in Charlotte. And, uh, you know, we do collaborations with mm -hmm. them, and we make beers together. And when you're in each other's breweries doing things, it's kind of fun to see the way somebody else does it. Mm -hmm. It's very nice. I think that's something that is really part of the industry that a lot of people don't understand. You know, there's a lot of people that right. think of it as a zero-sum game, and I think most of us think we can grow the pie. Um, and I think the numbers bear that out. Yeah. If you look at, you know, craft beer is still growing 17%, and uh, the overall beer market's growing 0.5% last year. Yeah. So, you know, from that standpoint, the volume is coming out of somebody, but it's interesting as you really look at the craft pie itself, because I think people are interested in engaging with local. They're interested yeah. in engaging with, hey, that's awesome. I know, I, I know I'm coming to visit a winery, a cidery, and a distillery um, sometime in the next month. So. So, so, Ed, and we've got less than two minutes left. So, Ed, you, you, you in competition with Richard Childress or Duplin County Winery or any of those folks? Or, again, are you, are you more of a peer group? Well, I think there is a certain amount of competition, but we also, um, we're part of a peer group. Uh, we work together. We, um, we join forces not only in the wine industry, but with the uh, wine, uh, the mm -hmm. beer and um, spirits to get laws changed that benefit us all. Mm -hmm. We need a few more laws changed um, to make it uh, easier to do business. Uh, mm -hmm. Still, with a certain amount of regulation, you got to have regulation, and but um, I, I'd say it's it's a little bit of both. Do you guys work together on the agricultural side? Oh yes. You do. Mm -hmm. So from if there's a blight or something like oh, that, yes. you guys all definitely kind of yeah. work together. To and say. it takes a lot of beer to make good wine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> good. <laughs> One end or the other. Uh, we all have the same thank problem. You. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, everybody shares the well, same pains. Trey, I, we're going to have to have you back because we're out of time. Uh, Henry, you need to come back and host this program because you might be better at it. <laughs> and I mean that in a good way. Thank you all for coming. Well, thank, uh, thank you. you. Good to Appreciate see you. Very, yeah. very nice being Deanna, here. Deanna, good luck to you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, yeah, no, we're out. Of, we're literally out of time. Uh, okay. Thank you. If you have any questions <laughs> or comments, uh, please go to our website, carolinabusinessreview.org. It's, it's one long word, but it's worth it, carolinabusinessreview.org. Uh, until then, I'm Chris William. We hope your weekend is good, and um, I guess cheers. See you. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment.
a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.